Years ago, I was asked to come preach the closing service of a youth weekend involving several different local churches in a particular city and being held on a local church campus. The closing session was in the sanctuary of that church building, and I was preparing to go in and speak and give that final message. And as I was preparing, I was walking out in the hallway that was kind of just outside the sanctuary. And as I walked and prayed, kind of thought through my notes and prayed through them. Sounds odd, but sometimes I kind of pray through my notes asking God just to give me direction and give me clarity and wisdom. And as I prayed, I looked around the hallway and I just noticed that the, the furnishings, the carpet, the paint uh, were all very well coordinated. And the fact that I even noticed that or observed that is uh, amazing in and of itself. But I just, I did, and I noticed as I walked along that there was a chair and a, <clears throat> some kind of a cabinet, a wooden, nice wooden cabinet. There were some wall mirrors and paintings, and on each piece of furniture was a small uh, brass tag. Um, and and on, on each brass tag, I noticed names written, and I thought that was intriguing. And so I stopped, and I, I looked more closely at one of the tags, and I realized that every piece of furniture or painting or equipment in that hallway or decorative equipment had one of these brass tags, had the names of people on it, but just before the names were the words, donated generously by. So every single tag was the name of the person who had apparently donated or given money for that piece of equipment, that furniture, that painting, that decorative fixture. And I got to tell you, a thought crossed my mind as I looked at that. I asked myself, maybe not out loud, but in my mind, I asked, who is getting credit for the giving of these things? The people or God? Ladies and gentlemen, when we give, when we serve, when we donate, when we invest, if we do these things with the expectation of ourselves being highlighted, we cease to honor the official definition of giving as listed in Scripture. If in giving I anticipate credit toward myself, it is not giving, it is purchasing ad space for myself. Giving. Where should the credit go for my giving? Let me suggest to you that if, if you have money to give, God gave you that money. If you have time to give, God gave you breath in your lungs and an extra 24 hours to serve Him in the first place. If you have material possessions to contribute, it is God who gave you the capacity to receive those, to, to purchase those, to acquire those material possessions anyway. So this morning, we're going to begin this series on six questions for Jesus on giving with this first question, where should the credit go for my giving? If you have your Bibles, you could turn to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Here's our primary thought. Every believer is called to give and serve in such a way that God is glorified and self is, you ready, anonymous. Every believer is called to give and serve in such a way that God is glorified and self is anonymous. Pastor, are you saying that if I give something, that if someone happened to find out that I gave it, then my reward is nullified? That's not what I'm saying. Today's message is all about your motive, either before you give, while you give, or even after the fact. Where should the credit for my giving go? Some, some answers on where that credit should go. Matthew chapter 6 is a, uh, the, the middle piece of a three-chapter sermon that Jesus preached. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. It is called the Sermon on the Mount. 
In the beginning of Matthew 5, it says Jesus went up to the mountains and he began to teach. And as he began to teach, Jesus began to preach a new way to worship God that was different from what what many of the religious leaders were leading out on. You see, many of the religious leaders were leading out with the idea that worshiping God was about outward behavior, the outward look, the trappings of the religion. Many of the religious leaders at that time in Jesus' area were were teaching and leading and, and kind of propagating this idea that worshiping God was about outward stuff and Jesus is about to turn them on their heads. In this sermon. And so in Matthew 5, Jesus begins preaching. We, we know of the Beatitudes that are listed here. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who... Attitudes that run contrary to what many thought were the right attitudes for worship at that time. But they were inward attitudes, and so he begins to deal with that. He begins to deal with the commandments and say, you thought the, command, the commandments were just about behavior. I'm telling you commandments are about attitude and inward spiritual growth. And he begins to address these kinds of things. As he gets to chapter 6, make no mistake about it, this entire sermon is confronting hypocrisy. The idea that as long as I look good on the outside, It doesn't matter what my heart or attitude is on the inside. As long as my stuff, my clothes, my buildings, my performance looks good on the outside, it doesn't matter what my heart looks like on the inside. He's dealing with that in this sermon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you this. Right now, there are many Christians, unfortunately, who tend toward this, And many people who are lost who believe this about Christianity, but I'm telling you, Christianity is not a faith that's about behavior. Let me say that again. Christianity is not about your behavior. If you start with your behavior, you're starting in the wrong place. Christianity is about a Savior who changes us from the inside out. And oh yeah, when He's in control, the behavior will reflect it. If you start with behavior, Christianity is no different than every other faith on the face of the earth. That is what Jesus is dealing with. Because the the, the reality is, if I could behave well enough to look good for everybody, I could be lost. And yet you think I'm okay because my behavior, my outward trappings are okay. And there may be some sitting in here today. You're going through the motions of church and you're lost. We've had that happen before at Green Acres. Someone come forward and say, I've been here for years, but I just realized I'm lost. I've been coming to church, coming to Sunday school, involved in activities. And on the outside, everyone would say, oh, that person's a good Christian. Not so much. And so Jesus is, is confronting that in the Sermon on the Mount. False religion. False religion draws attention to my actions. True Christianity works to glorify God and point people to God. False religion exalts people. Christianity exalts the person of Christ. And so that is essentially what the Sermon on the Mount confronts. And as we begin uh, Matthew chapter 6, the, the, the midst of that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to confront activities, <laughs> Spiritual activities like giving, like praying, like serving, like fasting. And ironically, all of them he addresses very similar. But as he begins Matthew chapter 6, he begins with a few words about our charitable acts or our righteousness depending on your translation. But in these first four verses, I think we can safely answer the question, where should the credit go for my giving? Where should the credit go for my giving? A few thoughts and answers about that beginning. Chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus starts by saying, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. The, the, the term take heed is in the imperative, by the way, which is a command form. And so he is commanding. He's calling us 
listen up, he says. He might even clap his hands like that, Pastor Mike, I don't know. Maybe he did. You all listen up. Be careful. Pay attention. By the way, this, this term for take heed came from a nautical term, which means to set a course in a certain direction and, and set your course that way. You set your course this way, Jesus is saying. You look this way and, and lock your eyes on it. Take heed to this. Do not do your charitable deeds before men. Charitable deeds, acts of righteousness. How many of you have a translation and it says acts of righteousness by a show of hands? That right there in that is acts of righteousness. Yeah, several of you. How many of you have a translation that says charitable deeds? A lot of you have, maybe the New King James or others. The idea here really is more of a broad uh, action uh, of activities of worship, of righteousness. For our purposes, we're thinking about them in terms of giving. But giving, by the way, was just one of the things that Christ would address in, uh, in, in all of this. But as you, as you get down into these verses we'll be looking at, you can see why it could easily be applied to our giving as we go along. So he says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds. Here's how not to do your giving. Here's how not to do your serving. Here's how not to do your investment in ministry. Do not do it to be seen by them. It's all about motive. He doesn't say... Don't do it, someone might see you. Don't do it in order so that someone might see you. And there are a lot of ways we do that, by the way. If you are giving, maybe you're giving a lot. Maybe you're giving proportionally a lot for you. And you're anticipating someone to give you a pat on the back because of your giving, and they don't. I suggest and you get offended by it, and you get upset about that, I suggest your giving was in order to be seen by men. I had a, had a seminary professor years ago who talked about a, a little old lady um, who was no longer able to come to church, and she was in a local nursing home, and every week her offering would come in. It was like $2. Uh, every single week it came in out of whatever her fixed income was. And then one day they had, had some wealthy businessman in the community come and give like, you know, at the time, this was back in the 70s, give, give like $100,000 or something. It was an enormous amount. And they, he, got, he said he got together with some of his leadership and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and spiritual leaders, and they said, you know, I really think we need to, to acknowledge this and maybe write a, uh, a note and really acknowledge the giving. And my, my seminary professor, I loved him. He was one of my favorites. He said, then if we're going to do that, then we're going to write a note and we're going to make a big deal about the $2 that's sent every week from this little lady to the nursing home because it costs her a lot more than it cost him. You see, the issue is if I'm giving, I don't care if anybody knows because my giving is unto the Lord. And so he goes on to say, don't do your deeds in order that men will see them. And here's the problem with doing that. You ready? Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Can I suggest to you this, first of all? If your if you're giving gives credit to people, doing it for men causes what we might call a forfeiture. You forfeit the reward God would have for you. You forfeit it. You're, you're trying to perform for the wrong people. You're, you're trying to perform for the wrong audience. Listen, when you stand up in the morning on Sunday mornings and sing... If you're singing so that people around you will be impressed, you're performing for the wrong audience. If you, if you give of your offering and you're looking for people to pat you on the back because of the size of it or the consistency of it or, or the, the amount of it, you're giving for the wrong people. If you're serving, I don't care if, if you've served in an area for 50 years and no one's ever thanked you and you're offended by it. I'm telling you, you're serving for the wrong people. The wrong audience. And guess what? Here, and here's the problem. you got all those years of service. You've been doing it so people would see you. Guess what? You have forfeited all the rewards you would have gotten for all those years of service. It is right here in the text. It's like going on one of those TV shows 
American Idol or America's Best Voice or what is that? What is that one? The Voice? Just the Voice? Is that? Whatever they are. <laughs> Imagine you went on one of those shows and you went out there and you did your thing, best you had ever done it, and you realized you had performed for the custodial staff. Nothing wrong with that, except you ain't going to get no prizes for them. You've got to perform for the real panel. <laughs> Listen, we we do these things oftentimes, and we're concerned if people notice or not. And I'm telling you, if you do, you're performing for the wrong audience. You're giving for the wrong people. And so if the credit for your giving goes to self or people or whatever the case might be, then it causes a forfeiture. Look at verse 2. Then he says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, pause. This is a statement that assumes. He is not commanding you to do a charitable deed, is he? He is assuming if you're a child of God, you are doing charitable deeds. He is assuming you're giving. He is assuming you're praying. He is assuming you're, you're serving others. This, this is not a command. Why would he need to command us to breathe? <laughs> hey, you all need to breathe now. Okay, exhale now. Nobody, nobody stands there and tells you to do that. You do it because you're alive. <clears throat> if you stop breathing, I have to command you to. Chances are you ain't alive. <laughs> Jesus says, if you're alive in Christ, if you're a child of God, if you're one of mine, there will be charitable deeds. So when you do them, when you do them, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. The the word hypocrite, it, it originally came out of a word referring to the theater, those who would play act. Now, if I'm in the theater and I've been given a part, the better I make people think I'm someone else, then the more effective I am. Right? Not so in the Christian life. He said there are certain people who are really, really good at making others think they are someone else when they're really not. And so this word hypocrite actually originally was a word that meant play actor. Someone who was a play actor person in a, in a play or a drama. Don't be like the play actors. Now, know this. Jesus was speaking in general, right? Because even today, we still have people who, who propose to be one thing and really they're not, who on the outside try to make people think they're one thing and really they're not. So we still have people who do that. At that time, Jesus was speaking to a specific group and they knew who they were. He had already done some battles, verbal battles with them, even at this point. So it didn't make them all that happy. He said, but don't be like them. Now, here's the problem. The them he was speaking of were some of the most respected religious leaders of the people at that time. His message was completely counterculture. Sometimes people look at the Bible today and it's an antiquated book. Know that when Jesus spoke this, he was speaking directly in conflict with the culture of that moment and that area of that time. Some of these religious leaders were highly respected, were honored, and and were given honor. And he was saying, you know all those people that you think are so great? Don't be like them. (laughs) Because too often they act one way on the outside. They dress one way. They look one way. And actually on the inside, they're not walking with the Lord. By the way, that's why when you look at the qualifications for a pastor, go back and look at 1 Timothy 3. Not right now, but at some point. Look at the qualifications for a pastor. Look at the qualifications for a deacon. And almost all of them are character issues, attitude issues. Almost none of them are abilities, actions. For a pastor, there's only one requirement a pastor has to have in terms of ability. That's able to preach, able to handle God's Word. That's it. That's really the only ability a pastor is required to have according to Scripture. Every other requirement is an integrity issue, a character issue, a spiritual issue, an attitude issue. See, that's what these leaders didn't get. 
They thought their actions on the outside, as long as it presented a certain front, that was religion. And Jesus is running against that. So he says, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Literally, as they walked along, as they fasted, they would make their faces look distorted so everybody would know they're fasting. When they gave, they would say they had these little silver trumpets. I don't really know. I don't think it takes a very big trumpet to make a loud noise, does it, Pastor? I mean, you could, pretty, pretty small trumpet. And they would literally have people blowing trumpets as they gave. I think of the widow and her might. Can you imagine some of the religious leaders who might have potentially been giving these large offerings and blowing the trumpet so everybody would know? Once again, in reference to my opening illustration, this is one of the reasons I have issue with, with naming things in the church after people who have given certain amounts of money. <clears throat> because what about the folks who give far less, but it costs them a lot more because they don't have anything? And so he says, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. <laughs> I love this final statement. He says, let me tell you something about them. I say to you, they have their reward. If you're giving, and you're giving in such a way that either before, during, or after, sometimes after the fact we give, <clears throat> sometimes we find ways to make sure people know that we gave. And it comes across, you know, very mild-mannered and maybe even humble. And yet in our minds, it's so, so people will know that we gave. And, and if that's the case, he said, Jesus said, okay, what, whatever pat on the back you get, whatever plaque they give you, whatever <laughs> applause you get for your giving, you better enjoy it because that's all you get <laughs> He says, I'm telling you, they have their reward. They got the pats on the back. They got the honor from the people. They got the applause. Fine. That's what they want. I got a lot more, but they ain't getting it. And neither are you if your giving is intended to be for people. And so watch this. Doing my giving, doing it for attention creates a shortfall. That, that is a reward I could have received, but I won't. Because I did it for people. Instead of for God. I listen, sometimes people will come to me and say, Pastor, I just want you to know something's happened, it's given up, and there are a couple of weeks that I'm, I miss my giving. Can I, can I be real honest with you? I don't look. Seriously. I don't look. I don't go through our contributions and look to see who's giving and who's not. I don't do it. Because James says, you don't treat the person who gives a penny any different than the person you give a million dollars. And I know myself, look, I'm human. And what if I inadvertently was looking and I knew who gave a bunch and who gave a little? And what if I, without trying, but I'm a human being, what, what if I accidentally treated someone different than the other because of what they gave? I don't look. Your giving doesn't need to be for me. Or, or, or somehow to think you're giving to what the, the preacher's telling us to do. Yeah, please, if you misunderstood me to think that your giving is supposed to be because I asked. You're missing the point. Doing it for attention creates a shortfall. That is, you could have gotten God's reward, now you won't. You'll get what you get right here on earth, that's it. <laughs> no more. Look at verse 3. But, again, when you do a charitable deed, the statement again, when you do it, there, from time to time, we need to share with you needs that we have in terms of positions or service, things going on in this church where we need people to fill in. Maybe we need to you know, hey, we've, we're doing this offering for a particular need or whatever. Um, and so sometimes we need to do that. In fact, at the end of the service today, I'm going to share with you a need we have for service. But by and large, we ought not need to do that because God's people are just serving. God's people are just giving. God's people are just investing. That's just, that's just what you do, he says. So but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. This is a phrase that, that has a lot of commentators curious as to kind of where it came from. There are several different ideas. Um, I, I tend to, when, when commentators disagree, I tend to lean toward the simplest explanation. But when you're reading the text, you're reading the scripture, and you're not sure what something means, go with the simplest explanation. 
That's generally the more, more accurate one. Don't try to get all deep and, and uh, metaphorical and all that. Just what does it say? Well, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. What, what, what is closer than my left hand and right hand? I mean, they're, they're right here. If I did something with my right hand and my left hand didn't know it, that would be pretty secretive. Not in a bad way. Just, it's just doing it. And if, my, and if my left hand did it and my right hand didn't know, that'd be just do it. Just take it. Throw the offering in. Don't tell the left hand you need, he needs to do it. He doesn't even need to know. Not even the left hand, which is so close to the right hand, needs to know what's happening. Can I suggest to you that where our giving's concerned, if we're doing it for God, it involves anonymity. If we're doing it for God, it involves anonymity. Pastor, what if, what if someone happens to find out what I gave? I didn't mean to. I wasn't trying to just happens to come across. You know what? It's motive. What is your intention? Yeah, sometimes I come across paperwork or things where I may see an offering envelope. Okay, that happens. That doesn't mean that person gave in such a way to make sure it would go across my eyes so I would see it. It just happened. But the issue here is my giving is done. I don't really care if anybody else ever knows about it. Now, we have counters. We, we have uh, financial people who see this stuff. But you don't give so that they'll be impressed. You just give as unto the Lord. Real giving to God involves anonymity. Look at verse 4. That your charitable deed may be seen in secret. So I'm doing this thing, giving, serving, investing, and I'm doing it in secret that my Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Can I suggest to you that doing it for real produces rewards? Giving, giving in a real way unto the Lord, not for people, <clears throat> not so that anybody else will know. Giving for real ultimately produces reward. Well, pastor, what will that reward be? Are you talking about material gain? I'm not one of those guys who's saying, if you give, then you'll get a nice car. Scripture does not teach that. If, there are, if, if you sit under preaching or are out there and people are teaching that, you, you prove to me in the Scriptures where we are guaranteed that. We're just not. There are a lot of things God rewards us with, though. It could be material possession. It could be that. I'm not saying it isn't. Maybe, he'll, maybe you're giving in such a way and pouring your life out and he opens up a job to you that gives you a raise, that, that gives you an increased income and, and so forth and so forth. That's fine. God may do that. Or God may give you some spiritual blessing where you see people saved because of what you gave or you see missionaries going because of what you gave or you see ministry happening in the lives of families because of what you gave. And then there's rewards after this earth that God's going to take care of as we give. But the fact is, when I give, when I, when I invest, I do it in order. So no, I don't care if anybody else sees it or not. I just want to do it as under the Lord. Every believer is called to give and serve in such a way that God is glorified and self is anonymous. The, uh, <clears throat> the Iowa State Cyclones college football team, they play their football games at the Jack Trice Stadium, Iowa State. They play their football games at the Jack Trice Stadium. This is a picture of it up on the screen. To the right is Jack Trice. How did his name get on their stadium? Well, to explain that, I'm going to have to back up almost 100 years. October the 5th, 1923, it was the eve of the first college football games of the season. Jack Trice was one of 22 black students at Iowa State University at that time. He had to, by the way, live off campus with his wife. He wasn't allowed to live on campus. He was the only black football player on that team, the only one in his conference. So the night before this first game, it would be his first starting football game. Trice was about 6'2 and about 200 pounds, which, by the way, back in that day was huge. <laughs> now, I know today that's like a running back. It's not an offensive line, but back in that day it was a defensive lineman. Jack played defense. 
He prepared to play his first game. And the night before his first game, which would be on October the 6th, against Minnesota, Iowa State was traveling to Minnesota, going to play them. He wrote this in his journal. And I'm reading an excerpt from Jack Trice, his journal, that night on October the 5th. My thoughts just before the first real college game of my life. The honor of my race, family, and self is at stake. Everyone is expecting me to do big things. I will. (laughs) My whole body and soul are to be thrown recklessly about the field tomorrow. Every time the ball is snapped, I will be trying to do more than my part. On all defensive plays, I must break through the opponent's line and stop the play in their territory. Beware of mass interference. Fight low with your eyes open and toward the play. Watch out for cross bucks and reverse end runs. Be on your toes every minute if you expect to make good. Jack. <clears throat> You'd have to know about football strategy back in that day. Uh, offenses would often run uh, a set that had, was later outlawed. <clears throat> it's called the flying wedge. <laughs> they would lock their arms together in a wedge. The running back would get behind them, and they would literally run over anybody in their way in an in almost impenetrable wall. It's very dangerous, especially with the uniforms they had. And so Trice was on defense. Second play of the game broke his collarbone. He told the coaches he was fine. He went back out to play. Later on in the game, he went up to make a play, was knocked down, and then was trampled by three Minnesota players on their way to the ball. He got up and said he was fine. He was not. They took him off the field. They rushed him to a hospital. He had internal bleeding from his injuries. But in that day, they didn't really have the capacity to be able to pinpoint where that would have been happening. Two days later, after that game with his girlfriend or his wife by his side, he died. October the, the 8th, 1923. Just, just want to add this. Um, there has been an ongoing debate in almost 100 years about the intent of those players who trampled him. I just want to say this. That year, in the Minnesota Golden Gophers homecoming parade, the KKK had a float. And so you can only imagine what the intent was with the only black player on the opposing team. 4,000 people from Iowa State University came to his funeral. Now let me clarify something. Iowa State University is 30,000, 40,000 now. Back in that day, it was three or 4,000. So literally the whole campus came to his funeral. In 1973, because students had given such an outcry for almost 50 years, they named the field at Iowa State after Jack Trice. And then in 1997, they named the whole stadium after him. Jack Trice Stadium at Iowa State. In my mind, one of the least known best stories in the history of college football. At that time, it's not so much anymore, but for many years, it was the only major football program, college football program, whose stadium was named after an African American. Later on, um, Ernie Davis, the, the field at Syracuse, would be named after him, but the stadium is still not. So Iowa State has a stadium and its field. You say, well, Pastor, he gave all of himself, but he got a stadium named after him, right? Well, you read his journal. He had no thoughts about that, no intentions. He just simply was giving himself away for a football game. Now, I get it. For Jack Trice, it was much bigger than a football game, wasn't it? It was about his race. It was about his family. It was about trying to strive for an equality that at that time America did not have. And so I'm wondering, if a guy like Jack Trice could pour himself out that way for a football game, with no thoughts about any rewards down the road. He never could have conceived having a stadium named after him. If he could pour himself out like that for a football game, how much more in the kingdom of God 
can we say, I will give and I'm not concerned about who knows. I will serve and I don't care if anybody ever pats me on the back. This is under the Lord. I will invest and all I want to know is that God is glorified and that His kingdom is extended. That's all I care about. That if as a church body, collectively, we lived and we gave and we served and we invested this way, what does that look like? We've got people at Green Acres Baptist Church, a lot of people who give this way, a lot of people who serve this way. We've had, we've had gifts given to this church, large gifts, $10,000, $20,000, $50,000. And sometimes if I gave you 100 guesses, you wouldn't be able to guess who it was because people just want to give. But do we have maybe some folks who aren't there yet? But what happens if collectively as a, as a church, as a whole, we operate this way? There, there is a statement in the business world that says you can get a lot done when nobody cares who gets credit. It's kind of a simple way of saying what if we gave? What if we served? What if we invested our lives and it doesn't matter who gets the credit as long as it's God? So today I'm going to suggest that if you're here without Christ, you're living your life on your own terms. <clears throat> God made you. God put breath in your body. And you need to know the Lord and He's offered you a way. And today may be a good day to come and say, I want to know Christ as my Savior because from this day forward, I want my life lived in such a way that it would give attention to God instead of just myself. Listen, if you're without Christ, you have no other option than just simply to live for yourself. And there's a lot of explanation behind that, not just a simple statement, but the Bible says that's true. Maybe you want to come and give your life to Christ today. Turn from your sin, turn to God, tell Him, Lord, my sins separate me from you. I want to turn to you and be saved. And maybe today's a good day to come first day of 2019. Maybe you just want to come and pray, Lord, I, I've, I've maybe got my feelings hurt because no one noticed all the good stuff I did. Lord, maybe I was a little offended because no one patted me on the back. And maybe you want to come and say, Lord, help me just to pour my life out unto you and it doesn't matter if anybody ever notices. Maybe you want to come pray for this church. Say, God, help us as a church to operate this way. If you would come pray for Green Acres Baptist Church right here at this altar, I'd praise God for that. Maybe you want to come be a part of this church and help make it that. I'm going to pray, and you're going to stand, and I want you to respond as the Lord leads. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, help us to obey you in these moments. You stand.